A warm welcome to each and every one of you for this course titled Ode to the Internal Limiting Membrane because the crust of what we are going to speak today is limited to the vitreoretinal interface. So before I start, I would like to state that the VI interface is not an elusive structure. It is a very definite structure composed of three different layers. The outermost layer of the posterior vitreous, the innermost layer of the posterior vitreous cortex, the intervening extracellular space, and the internal limiting membrane of the retina. This is the most important structure covering the macula, and it is responsible for the macular oxygenation, diffusion of nutrition into the macula, and if you have a pathology either with aging or with disease, especially diabetes and epiretinal membrane formation, the drugs that you inject into the vitreous cavity may not perfuse into the macula. So the a look at the vitreoretinal interface is very, very important and surgical VR pathologies are, as I said earlier, are bread and butter. So again, what we are going to speak today centers around a story that is told badly. The story of the anomalous posterior vitreous detachment where synchysis and synergesis does not go hand in hand. There may be liquefaction of the vitreous without separation of the vitreoretinal addition. And what occurs smoothly as a posterior vitreous detachment occurs as an anomalous PVD, which is symptomatic for the patient, leaving behind a layer of vitreous over the macular surface called the vitreoschisis. This shytic vitreous has hyalocytes in it, which will incite as kind of inflammatory reaction recruiting monocytes from the retina. It forms a macular pucker and a variety of pathologies such as macular hole formation. So as we go down the line, we have Biju here who will be speaking to us on epiretinal membrane ma management. Ashad will be speaking on vitreomacular attraction syndrome. There may be a little bit of overlap between both their, all of our talks. Manoj will cover macular holes and I will deal with the role of uh, deroofing of the macula in chronic macular edema, diabetic macular edema. This is uh, purely Trivandrum VR group. All of us are from Trivandrum and we welcome each one of you once again. Before I end up, since I have a little time, I'd like you to understand that there is a topographic variation in the inter -limiting, internal limiting membrane. It is an undulating structure. It is attached more firmly at the posterior pole. It is thinner and less loosely attached at the periphery. If you can see that the undulation fits into the crevices of the retina and when we are peeling, we are definitely going to traumatize the retina. As you go down the line, we will see, but luckily for all of us, the, these changes, although there is a physiological and electrophysiologic changes that occur following internal limiting membrane peeling, it does not affect the patient's vision. And unlike any other structure in the body, where with aging there is atrophy, Internal limiting membrane may probably the only structure that becomes fatter with aging. The older you are, the thicker is the membrane. That is why we are able to peel the membrane. If you try peeling it in a child, it is extremely difficult. I would be wrong if I do not project this slide. This is, shows the, what we are peeling. We are peeling the basement membrane, the Muller cell of the retina. The Muller cell are what is shown in yellow the scaffold of the retina, which is responsible for the retinal shape. And when we are peeling the outermost layer, the foot process of the Muller cell, it does leave behind some abnormality. So here we are dealing with an adversary who is important, but not that important. Thank you very much. I call upon the first speaker, Biju, to come onto the stage. Good morning all. At the outset, let me thank Meena Madam for uh, including me in this excellent instruction course. So I will be talking about the ERM, periodal membrane management. So a slide first to 
just let you know what it is. It's a fibrocellular tissue found on the inner surface of the retina, semi-translucent and proliferates on the surface of the internal limiting membrane. Now we have got two situations basically where you have the ERM. One is the idiopathic which is the commonest where we usually feel and the other one is the secondary ERM. Secondary to so many diseases which have been mentioned here, we can, you can see. I'm not going through the list. And uh, when you talk about the pathology, it's basically the membrane is composed of retinal glial and retinal pigment epithelial cells. Then there will be fibrous astrocytes, fibrocytes, myofibrocytes, and macrophages also, depending upon the pathology and whether there is a secondary component also involved. The pathophysiology, as Madam was talking about, it's all related to the, especially the idiopathic, is related to the anomalous PVD. So when you have the PVD, there will be a residual cortical, cortical vitreous on the ILM due to the incomplete separation. This itself, if supported by some inflammatory material, can proliferate into an uh, epidural membrane. Or in addition to that, there can be some dehiscences in the ILM through which the microglial cells can migrate to the surface and result in proliferation of the glial cells over the top of the ILM. And for secondary ERM, there will be other inflammatory mediators which is also coming into the pathophysiology. Now, as far as the diagnosis, I mean, initially, in the early stages, it used to be difficult because in the frontal spectrum, we may not be able to see much of that. It may not be that evident. But with the coming of the OCT, it is quite easy because it is very well distinguishable in the OCT as a discrete, irregular, and hyperreflective line. Now, in the OCT, I'm not going through all these things. In the OCT, one thing that I wanted to stress is the presence of, that. this is one thing that we'll be looking for, the presence of any continuous ectopic inner foveal layer, or EIFL. This is a band which is extending from the inner nuclear layer and inner plexiform layer across the fovea. Now, when those layers are present, it uh, sort of uh, results in a poorer prognosis. And it is also important as far as the staging of the ERM is concerned, based on the OCT which you can see here, the first two stages we don't have the EIFL or the ectopic inner foveal layers. In the second, in the, in the third stage and the fourth stage, we have got this uh, uh, the EIFL and the last one, that is the stage four, we have got the EIFL especially and along with that there will be a complete distortion of the retinal layer. We don't be able to distinguish the retinal layers at all. Now, regarding the treatment, now, the treatment there is no confusion. It is parsplana vitrectomy plus the peeling of the epiretinal membrane. Now, the issues in the decision making which we are more concerned about here is that one is when to operate and when not to operate. Now, there will be the what is the visual acuity threshold at which you operate, whether you operate in asymptomatic patients. So, there's a lot of differences from surgeon to surgeon as far as this is concerned, but generally, especially if personally speaking, I usually have a visual threshold of about 6 by 12. I don't operate when the vision is better than 6 by 12, but that can vary. And uh, significant metamorphosia is another uh, probable indication when we would uh, basically decide on peeling that. The second important issue which we are more concerned here is how to manage the ILM at the time of the surgery. Whether we peel the ILM along with the ERM, that is called the double peel, whether we do it or whether we peel only the ERM, that is a single peel. Now, the little difficult uh, decision because the uh, the jury is still out. Now the arguments in favor of the ILM peel or the double peel is that if you peel the ILM, it is going to ensure complete removal of the epiretinal membrane, no doubt about that. It reduces the recurrence rate and it also facilitates greater resolution of the retinal folds and better anatomical uh, restoration. But it is not a procedure as uh, Ma'am has already told. It has got some uh, risk because there can be uh, the stripping of the ILM removes the mullar cell foot plates. So it is reasonable to expect some amount of retinal trauma. And there will be other adverse events sometimes such as the eccentric uh, paracentral macular hole formation, the macular microscotoma, the retinal dimbling, and uh, these are some of these things. So in the presence of this, may not be very visually relevant, in the presence of this, is the ILM peel going to give you some additional advantage as far as the vision is concerned? Now, the, all the studies have failed to actually uh, uh, conclude that there is a significant difference as far as the long-term visual outcome is concerned, whether you peel the ILM or not. And uh, many of these recurrences, for example, if you look at this study, this wonderful study actually outlines all these studies in 2003-2017, and there is no significant difference as far as the visual equity is concerned in all these studies between the double peel and the single peel. 
and also the recurrences. Many of these recurrences are not significant. Large part of these recurrences are not significant enough to produce a visual indication. Again, visual deterioration so much as to uh, indicate a reoperation. So another uh, aspect is the simultaneous. You know, some, sometimes most, some, some of the ILM also appeals along with the ERM whether you want it or not. So that is also there. And uh, Trianos et al. has actually proposed uh, uh, a, a method, you know, based upon their, their study, they have even proposed that if you are peeling the ILM, then it may be limited to patients showing focal, that is less than 50% of ER macular adhesions on the preoperative SDOCT, so as to avoid unnecessary trauma to the retina. So, the uh, basic uh, uh, the process, I mean, procedure which I am generally doing is that, you know, the, initially I complete the vitrectomy, core vitrectomy, then uh, use the triamcinolone in order to check for the PVD, make sure that the PVD is complete. If the PVD is not complete, induce the PVD. Then stain the ILM with brilliant blue-green under air. And after staining, I generally uh, start an ILM peel from an area where there is no ERM, that is much beyond the uh, ERM. So that, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an area where there is no ERM. And once it reaches up to the edge of the ERM, I can even uh, see that ERM being lifted by the ILM, because the ILM is anyway under the ERM. So at this point, you can definitely see the edge of the ERM. And once uh, that ILM reaches up to the edge where the ERM is there, now I will just shift the instrument. But till now, I was using the membrane scraper. Now I take the ILM forceps and try to grasp both the ILM and the epiretinal membrane in a single hold and try to strip the entire thing. So now what I think is that I'm removing the ERM along with that ILM what is coming off. I may not be always correct, so some of the ILM may, not, may be still uh, left there, but uh, I think I'm getting most of the ILM. And after this, uh, this will be followed by, yeah, the fluid air exchange, and it will be left with the air. So this was, this was our case. This is the preoperative, uh, uh, you can see the preoperative OCD, and this is the postoperative picture after two months. So there's a definite improvement here. The vision has improved so much. In another case, again the same, same uh, this thing, starting the ILM peel from an area much beyond. And now when you're coming to that area, grasping the ERM here. But in this case, as you can see, the ILM fragments. I'm not very sure whether I got everything out there. Probably some of the ILM is left there. But it's a very thick ERM. And uh, so it is coming out as a whole, as you can see in the video. So that is the ERM coming off. And then it is, it is followed by the fluid air exchange and leave, you leave it like that. Now, so this was that case. So that is the preoperative OCT and the postoperative OCT you can see. Now, some of these cases, especially this was a secondary uh, ERM. I'm not very, uh, don't remember exactly what it was because it was done a long time back. But here, as you can see, even the PVD, I was not able to complete. There is the PVD is also very thick and posterior hyaluronic. You can see the uh, triamcinolone crystal still remaining there. So I had to actually incise the... P uh, posterior hyaloid with a membrane pick and after incising the membrane pick I'm trying to get the hyaloid, peel the hyaloid also, that's another membrane. Now in this area you can see that the hyaloid is actually attached to the ERM and along with that hyaloid the ERM also is coming off. So in this case, uh, in the, so uh, during, yeah, here, here you can see that the ERM is also coming off along with that hyaloid. So, such cases, you again uh, stain, again stain with brilliant blue-green after uh, finishing of the, uh, after pre removing the whatever posterior vitreous is remaining, then I stain again. So, this is, this is exactly what is that, that you come again and stain with brilliant blue-green and again uh, start the ILM peeling. So, I'm grasping with the forceps here. You can see the ILM peeling is being completed. So, this case, actually it also... So it's, it's, almost, it's almost complete. So that is the ILM being uh, taken off. And uh, yeah, that, 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 that is that, that membrane just, just finishing. 
and uh, here also you can see a some I mean this is this is all uh, mild trauma this can uh, what was mentioned now sometimes this this happens when you are uh, when you when you are uh, trying to grasp the ILM so I had to lesser that area even though it was a full thickness wall maybe it was not necessary but that is done so again coming to the conclusion so peeling out the ILM definitely ensures complete removal of the ERM it improves the prognosis and reduces the risk of the ERM recurrence but the fact is that Current literature has failed to provide a strong evidence for the beneficial role of the ILM removal during the ERM surgery. And so it is up to the individual surgeon and uh, it depends, it varies from case to case also. Thank you. Thank you, Biju, for those excellent videos. Uh, if there are no questions from the audience, how many of you practice retina? I saw Thomas Cherian. Three, four, four of us. So do you do a combined ERM ILM peel or you peel only the ILM? Only the I or the ERM, okay. Thank you, Biju. Next is, I think, Ashad. He will be speaking to us on vitreomacular attraction syndromes. Madam, uh, how do we manage uh, patients, you know, with this IFR? Uh, he was talking about uh, ectopic inner foveal layers. I mean, uh, because this has to be differentiated from epiretal membrane. Unlike uh, uh, the routine epiretal membranes, these cases, you know, peeling uh, may sometimes uh, you end up with uh, full thickness holes. So, I feel it's grade two ERM. Grade three and four. Three and four. Three and four. That you can remove the ERM. Yeah, we can remove the ERM, but now peeling these. Uh, these Eiffel layers, you know, you know, as you as you peel, you should be careful uh, because you may end up with uh, full thickness holes in these patients. Also, there is something called uh, LHEP. Uh, yeah, so this uh, this is not seen typically in ERMs. It's seen in lamellar holes with the ERMs. So these uh, things also have to be you know very careful. There is a technique where you just imbricate uh, the LHEP into the hole and not try to peel because these are Muller cells which are going deep into the uh, to the to the base of the lamellar hole and it can actually end up with a full thickness holes. If you just uh, relax the internal limiting membrane, peel some part of it, you see that the rest of the internal limiting membrane is loose and further pathologies rarely occur. At least somewhere you have to loosen the internal limiting membrane because there is always the membrane becomes thickened and uh, there will be a macular pucker. So if you, even if you are not peeling right off the fovea, you can peel all around. Remove the ERM and peel the ILM all around. So that is what I, I was also trying to do. You know, I mean, after peeling the ERM, I feel it is a little dangerous to again go back and peel. That, as Manoj was telling, some of these ERMs, especially the types of cases that we do, they are very advanced. And so it would be there will be a lot of retinal distortion. Definitely, it is going to end up in trauma. So I was just trying to balance these two so that the ILM is peeled from an area where there's no ERM, where it is safer. And once you come here, you just try to peel the entire thing, what is left there. The ILM loosens, so your further loosens. peeling becomes easier. So this situation would be more dangerous for what Ashad is going to talk about when there is a vitreo macular traction. You definitely can deroof the central retina and produce a macular whole intraoperatively. Thank you, Mina Madam, for giving me this opportunity. I will talk a little on vitreomacular tractions. <coughs> so we know the normal retina is attached completely to the uh, normal vitreous is completely attached to the uh, retina with the firm attachments to the vitreous base and uh, over the disc and at the fovea and over the blood vessels. So after the age of 40, the vitreous started gradual liquefaction and uh, the fluid sweeping in between the ILM and the posterior vitreous phase, which gradually increases over the time, maybe by uh, around uh, 60 to 70 or by 80 years of age, the, the posterior vitreous detachment will become complete. The posterior vitreous detachment can become complicated with a focal adhesion or a broad braced adhesion somewhere in the retina uh, abnormally. So it can create uh, uh, visual symptoms may decrease visual acuity and once the vitreomacular adhesion becomes uh, symptomatic it will be visible in OCT and it is called as uh, then called as vitreomacular traction. In this picture you can see the foveal 
uh, vitreum macular reduction which is uh, asymptomatic but uh, with the saccadic movements and uh, further traction uh, there will be foveal outer retinal uh, vacuole formation and uh, uh, gradual increase in symptoms. So when the uh, uh, attachment is broad based it will be making a foveal profile flattening and uh, if it is uh, increased it can even go up to a retinal detachment like Dr. Biju has said uh, this is a retinal membrane which is uh, often called as cellophane maculopathy where we will be having a single layer of glial cells only but it can also be multiple layer of uh, cells including macrophages even retinal pigment epithelial cells glial cells uh, and fibroblasts which can provide traction on the retina <coughs> so this picture you can see the uh, the posterior vitreous uh, phase where the arrow shows the growing in of a epiretinal membrane using the posterior vitre posterior hyaloid phase as a scaffold to grow for these cells. Once these cells grow into the vitreous phase then it will become more tenacious and it will make it difficult for a spontaneous uh, uh, resolution of the uh, PVD. So here this is uh, showing because of the traction how uh, uh, edema increases inside the retinal layer vitromacular traction can be associated with the diabetic macular edema also and once uh, there is an association it, the diabetic macular edema can be seen increased by almost uh, uh, threefold times uh, than in the normal patients without a PVD or uh, with complete PVD. Uh, this shows uh, a patient with uh, epiretinal membrane and diabetic macular edema uh, underwent vitrectomy and ERM peeling and we can see how well the edema has resolved uh, after the vitrectomy and uh, ERM peeling. VMD can also be associated with the AMD and uh, in that case uh, it will be the adherence will be seen often above the uh, neovascularization area. Uh, this is a pathology uh, where there will be disruption of the choroidal blood flow to the macula because of the traction on the retina the hypoxia, hypoxia will be produced which will lead to increased wedge formation in turn will go for AMD. So should we, how are we going to manage it? Should we observe or should we treat it with a vitrectomy or a, a pharmacological vitreolysis? So uh, uh, even though it is uh, difficult to predict uh, the resolution, spontaneous resolution, there are reports uh, of almost 10 to 11 percentage of the cases having spontaneous resolution of vitro macular traction without producing any uh, problems. So to avoid uh, 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 any unnecessary surgery, the standard of care today is to observe for at least three months. Likewise, uh, in VMT, uh, in macular holes also, we can see almost 9 percentage of the patients uh, having spontaneous uh, resolution, especially when they are uh, of size more than, uh, less than 400 microns. And uh, the eye disease case control study has shown uh, almost uh, up to 37 per, uh, percentage of the cases increasing in macular hole size over a period of uh, six years. So for uh, VMT and vitrectomy, for VMT and macular holes, uh, vitrectomy, vitrectomy was uh, suggested for macular holes first in 1991 and after that a lot of refinements has uh, happened to the uh, surgery which has made it a little more controllable. Here in this case we can see the vitromacular uh, uh, traction there where uh, after staining uh, the vitreous I have decided to do uh, a vitrectomy, I mean, uh, to do the uh, surgery without de-roofing the uh, posterior vitreous phase uh, by using a high speed cutter and uh, using a reduced uh, suction we can have a controlled uh, uh, removal of the posterior vitreous phase without de-roofing. We have to be very careful about this because once de-roofing ha happened, you know, this case I was planning to do without ILM peeling. So if a de-roofing happens then we will have to go for ILM peeling otherwise it's going to uh, extend uh, definitely. So with a controlled uh, reduced suction and a high cut rate we can remove that uh, leaving the strand of uh, vitreous fibrils over the fovea. ILM peeling is uh, definitely uh, showing uh, is needed and it uh, shows better results. Dr. Maharaj will be talking detail on that. 
So most of the patients who need a vitrectomy for a VMT will be of age 60 or above and they will be having cataract at the time of the diagnosis or sooner or later they will need a cataract surgery, especially after vitrectomy, cataract is going to increase. So most often combined vitrectomy and cataract surgery can be done and when, when it is done along with uh, there is higher incidence of posterior sinusoidal formation and uh, uh, intraocular related in the lens related complications and uh, myopic shift of maybe some point to five or so can be seen in such patients. Sequential vitre uh, vitrectomy and uh, cataract surgery can be done but uh, when, uh, when while, while doing cataract surgery because of the lack of vitreous support uh, while giving uh, infusion into the anterior chamber we can see the lens diaphragm lens iris diaphragm going down uh, and it will make it difficult for the surgery to be performed uh, there is also chances of increased chances of pizzerent i i personally prefer to do uh, a sequential surgery because uh, the, for the aesthetic reasons so that uh, the iris adherence and uh, posterior sinusoidal formation will not be there when you do sequential surgery and it will be nice to see around and reacting people after cataract surgery so but the literature is in favor of doing a combined uh, phaco vitrectomy because the visual recovery is uh, uh, quicker and uh, the outcome is also good uh, can be there can be, when we doing uh, going for vitrectomy there can be issues uh, it can go out to a, a retinal detachment like in this uh, case uh, the earlier case which I have shown you I was finishing the case after the uh, nice vitrectomy and uh, leaving the uh, macula quite uh, healthy but on a on examination the periphery you can see a little lattice which was there earlier which was not evident like this but it has become more evident maybe because of the PVD or the traction while doing the vitrectomy. So I have decided to do a vitreous shaving at that area at the base and uh, uh, keep uh, the area around the lattice uh, uh, traction free. But while doing vitrectomy near that uh, uh, the lattice uh, the, there is a de-roofing of the uh, retina on that lattice and uh, it has become a hole. Now I have to treat that uh, hole uh, with a laser and a cry or cryo otherwise it will end up uh, in a uh, retinal detachment like we said. So pharmacological uh, vitreolysis is, po is possible. Plasmin is an enzyme which is uh, there in uh, useful, used uh, in, in the human body which is uh, uh, important for uh, clot lysis and uh, ocriplasmin is uh, a plasmin, is a human recombinant plasmin which is uh, given intravitreally for, uh, for uh, vitreolysis. It was manufactured by Thrombogenesis and it was being marketed by Alcon in America and uh, uh, European Union, was not available in India. But uh, they have withdrawn it from the market in 2020 and not available. So we are, uh, will be ending up doing in vitrectomy only. So to conclude, patient should be observed for two to three months. ILM peeling is good and a simultaneous cataract surgery is uh, suggested. So thank you all and once again, I'd like to invite you all for the release of Laika, which is a movie directed by me. will be coming in theatres uh, soon. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Ashrad, on your movie. Your last movie was excellent. Ashrad has been very cautious in uh, telling you that FACO combined procedures are associated with complications. They are not. And the patient usually wants visual recovery very fast. But there is only one setback. You have to tell the patient that unlike his neighbor who underwent just a simple cataract surgery, a patient with a vitreo macular pathology takes a very, very long time to get the ultimate visual recovery. They do get good visual recovery, but it takes longer. And they should not be comparing their results with a simple cataract surgery. Otherwise, the surgery per se is not difficult. The post-operative complications are also not much. Over to you, Manoj. Manoj, you speak to us on macular holes. Thank you, madam, for, the, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll be speaking to you on the macular hole surgery and ode to the ILM. So some of the introduction uh, slides have already been covered, but I'll just go through this. Now, in terms of uh, you know, macular hole, we all uh, traditionally use uh, OCT as a preoperative uh, tool. This is to understand how the hole is, how to, how to, and to understand how the vitreo macular adhesion is. So we have these, uh, these gradings, grade 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the grade 1 is an impending macular hole, 
without you know a, a full thickness hole as such. And grade two and three are um, holes with vitreomacular um, traction. And grade four is when there is a complete separation of the vitreous, and you have a um, any sized macular hole with us, complete separation of the vitreous. And we also have the international classification group, which has uh, classified holes into full thickness macular holes into small, medium, and large. So any hole which is less than 250 micron is called a small hole. Between uh, 250 to 400 micron is a medium hole, and more than 400 micron is a large hole. So this is some, we, should, we need to do a preoperative uh, OCT to understand the vitreoretinal interface and the size of the hole before we think of managing these patients. Kelly and Vendal uh, in 1991 introduced this concept of vitrectomy for macular holes. And uh, Eckhart in the year 1997 introduced the concept of ILM peeling. And since then oh, we have never looked back. We have a lot of modifications and as Madam rightly said, this is one of the co most commonest surgeries that we perform in our day-to-day you know, -day surgical practice. Now this also Madam covered a bit in terms of you know, what is the role of Muller cells. The Muller cells, the green, you know, the central structure that you see there, you know, that is the Muller cell. It spans across the retina and this gives 50% uh, you know, of the retinal rigidity is due to the Muller cells. And that's an important thing we need to remember. And the ILM which we peel now is the, the food plate of the Muller cells, right? like chopping off your, the legs. Now then what happens, the whole, ret there is a, the, the whole retina gets a little unstable and this increased retinal compliance helps us to close the holes. Also you know, the studies have shown that there is a reparative retinal glial proliferation that occurs uh, you know, after ILM peeling. So all these you now help us um, in closing the macular holes. Now if you look at meta-analysis, um, it is very clear that ILM peeling is very useful in stage 2 to stage 4 macular holes. But the question is, do we need to peel ILM in all cases? So the size actually matters. So for me, I look at the basal diameter of the hole. That's an important consideration for me. So when, uh, when you have a small hole, or um, uh, that is a hole which is less than um, 400 microns, you don't really need to peel the ILM. The, if you just do a good PVD induction, the hole closes by itself. And if you have a larger hole, more than 400 microns, definitely you need to peel the ILM. So that is one thing that has come out from the meta-analysis, that a large hole, you need to peel the ILM. We also have a lot of indices, the hole forming factor, the macular hole index, the diameter hole index, and you know, tractional hole index, a lot of complex uh, you know, uh, indices. You could use one of these indices, um, which, which will suit your practice, and also take a decision on whether you need to, you are looking at a good prognostic hole or a bad prognostic hole, and if you're looking at a bad prognostic hole, definitely you need to peel the ILM. Now, uh, Rahimi et al. has also showed in, in their meta-analysis that you know, in terms of reopening, though it's a very small percentage, reopening of holes are more in holes which have not undergone an ILM peeling as against ILM peeling. So all this you now are in support of ILM peeling for macular holes. Now ILM is a, trans, uh, is a transparent structure, so we, to visualize the ILM, we need to use a dye like ICG or, tri, or tripan blue or brilliant blue to stain the ILM. And, and this, once you stain, it's just like the capsule, the anterior capsule. Once you stain these uh, membranes, they get a little rigid and they become more breakable. And that is what helps us in, in peeling these membranes. So the usual technique that we do is a pinch and peel technique. As you can see in the video here, we are using an ILM forceps, the special forceps, the ILM forceps. So after you make this small defect in the ILM, you can grasp this edge of the ILM, create a small flap, and then this flap can be propagated. So this is one way you can, you can start your peeling. You can also use uh, the finesse's loop here. This is an, a wire-like instrument, now which you can use to kind of rub on the ILM and then create a flap. Or you could use an instrument like, you know, scraper. This is a diamond dusted scraper which is used to, uh, to, to peel the ILM. So you could use any of these instruments to, to, to start the peeling and then you can propagate the, the, the peeled area with the forceps. Now the, the traditionally, you know, we nowadays do the small gauge surgery. It's a little old surgery. Um, this is a 23 gauge vitrectomy. We could do 23 or 25 or 27 gauge vitrectomy. The crucial stage is this PVD induction. The PVD induction is a very important stage. I always do not use IVTA, but in certain situations I do use IVTA when I, when I think I have not got this good whiz ring when I do the PVD induction. After that we inject a brilliant blue dye and then we start our peeling. So here, as I said before, I am using the 
the ILM forceps here to make that first uh, defect on the ILM. And, um, and then the, the flap is raised. And once the flap is raised, now you kind of propagate the flap um, around the hole. There are some techniques, some people like to go across the hole. Some people, um, you know, this, um, with, with techniques like where you want to uh, preserve the ILM around the hole for an, for an additional procedure like tucking, you may need to go around the hole. Um, and it's always better you now to keep these flaps, I always try to keep these flaps long so that you, know, you get a good, you can control the, the area of peeling. Area of peeling is, an, is, is also a little controversy. There is some controversy on the area of peeling, whether you should peel large or peel small. But here, no, the, uh, here you see uh, this is a fairly good peeling that I've got. So this is, uh, then you look at the vitreous base for any missed breaks as, uh, uh, as Dr. Ashad was saying. And then finally, um, we do a fluid air exchange and inject, I inject gas. I like to use um, SF6 because it's a short tamponade. I put the patients on a prone position for at least um, three days now. So this is uh, how we perform the surgery. So although there is a wide, widespread acceptance of ILM peeling, there is no consensus on how wide to peel. Uh, so the conventional peeling is around two disc diameters and uh, what, what, something which is extends up to four disc diameters is called an extended ILM peeling. Um, now Mahesh is here, their paper showed us that you know, there's, there's a similar closure rate with both the uh, small as well as large peeling. But um, the, in the smaller peeling eyes, you know, they had better visual acuity as against another group which showed that you know, the extended peeling eyes had you know, better visual acuity and uh, better anatomical closure. So there is some controversy as to, uh, I like to peel them less because as Madam rightly said, um, that we really, we are slackening the retina. We do not know the long term effects of this. We just need to peel enough to, to close the holes. So we have this uh, Manchester large macula hole study which looked at um, ILM peeling in large macula holes. And they came to the conclusion that if you have a hole diameter of 400 to 650 microns, ILM peeling alone still is enough. So even for large holes, ILM peeling works well if it is up to 650 microns. Now if it is more than that, then the, the closure rate was inadequate. So then they suggested that you need to go in for an additional procedure. So this would be an indication for additional procedures. Michalowski et al. Um, uh, introduced the concept of inverted ILM flap where you know, they, they, they tucked in these holes and meta-analysis have shown that anatomical closure rates are, are better and visual improvement is also better in these, these eyes. The different ways of tucking in, here what I'm doing is I'm trying to tuck in with the, with the cutter itself. Now after making a small, um, uh, after pruning the edges, now I'm just tucking in with the, with the cutter, cutter itself. So you, you could do that. You can also tuck, uh, this, this is an example of a large macula hole with this technique. You can see the ILM that is there, this is at one month and this is at three months. ILMs may, may be there for a long time, up to six months, you know, you may still see these, these uh, membranes, the ILM membranes sticking um, in the region of the hole. This is a type one closure. This is a tuck-in where I'm using a forceps. Now sometimes, you know, I would like to do it under air because the, the flaps are, you know, you can mobilize the flaps um, more easily. And sometimes I put a drop of visco there so that, you know, this these flaps, you know, are still maintained there. So you could also do it under air, though the visualization is slightly difficult under air. This is a patient with a 1,424 mi micron holes, which again, you know, it shows a type 1 closure. We have, in our analysis, and all these uh, uh, yellow arrows that you see, you know, we did an analysis, and we found that you know, it's a temporal portion of the hole which actually shifts. So more than the nasal, it's just a more of a temporal portion. So like when, when, when you peel, it would be nice to peel more temporally than nasally, because that would uh, allow easy, uh, you know, movement shift of the retina uh, to close the holes. You could also use PFCL um, here. And PFCL also keeps the, the flaps in place and it's very easy to, kind of the visualization is also better, so it's easy to, to do it under PFCL. So meta-analysis have clearly showed that, you know, the, when they compared in large holes, when they compared inverted flap versus um, ILM peeling alone, they showed that, you know, the superiority of um, the inverted ILM flap in terms of anatomical and visual outcomes. Um, Michalowski uh, in 2015 introduced the concept of just a temporal peel, where you know, instead, of, um, instead of just peeling across the fo um, fovea, he just created a temporal flap and just left it there and then did a fluid direction. The closure rates were excellent. Um, and um, this is something that we sometimes do. Doc Dr. Uni does this. In, uh, he does this cabbage flaps, where you know, he just prunes these flaps around 
the macular hole and then without no tucking in just does a fluid direct exchange after this these these holes also now close excellently well you can see the flap there uh, you know this is a type 1 closure at the end of 3 months um, this is something that you now uh, that i like to do for a little larger holes um, i do a vacuum closing of the hole so nothing different after the ilm peeling i peel across the fovea and then i do a small uh, fluid direct exchange right at the macular hole and um, the, the, i i believe that you now with, with, without any intervening tissues these holes um, close better and there's early drying in these holes and they close better we had a paper this um, this conference where we showed that it was as efficient as the ilm tucking so the failure of macular holes is around 10 to 12% uh, and most of the time is due to persistence of vitreal um, the vitreo macular traction element or inadequate removal or regeneration of the ear i mean such patients definitely you need an additional procedure like a tuck in now um, in this uh, in this patient now when you have a failed macular hole definitely i would like to put in a pfcl because the free flaps i try to do a free flap to close these holes and free flaps you know is very difficult now they are quite mobile and therefore now putting in a pfcl bubble and then uh, creating taking these free flaps and putting them under the pfcl bubble and closing is a is a use, very useful technique so also in retinal detachment now in retinal detachment put, uh, peeling under a pfcl helps um, helps to, uh, to to keep the posterior pole attached and uh, and you can actually um, peel around the macular hole so the success depends on what type of hole you are dealing with in an idiopathic macular hole the success rate is good but in other situations traumatic myopic and retinal you know, secondary holes the you know, success rate is not so good and that we have to keep that in mind like this patient you now with a mac with a this is a thick and posterior hyoid with a vmt i did a um, um, vitrectomy and ended up with a hole this is um, under oil and uh, with time you now by around 4 months you can see this epiretinal proliferation around the macular hole you now trying to open up the macular hole even wider so when under silicon when i remove the silicon oil i did the peeling and did the stuffing in and um, now we have a closed closed hole so to conclude um, so any hole which is less than 400 microns an ilm peeling is not really necessary um, uh, between 400 to 800 milli, uh, microns i would definitely peel the ilm and for those which are more than 800 microns, failed holes, secondary holes, I would definitely use a flap-based technique, either of, you know, either tucking in or in a temporal flap or one of these modifications. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manoj. Uh, we'll have some discussion after Madam's talk. I welcome uh, Mina, Madam to give her talk on macular hole. Actually, 25 years back, we used to listen to Mina, Madam for macular hole surgery when we were doing PG in RIO in 96. So... No, <laughs> <laughs> I got into retinal uh, seeing her videos. Uh, I was a postgraduate when she was, uh, she was in Arvind. And you know, we used to... I, had, I was fortunate enough to spend time in her OTs and that's how I got into retina, ma'am. In an institute, surgery is different. You are always performing to your podium, but not so in private practice. You are doubly cautious in whatever you do. Thank you, Manoj. My, last, my talk is the last one in this series, and it's a little different in that we are dealing with a different pathology. But basically, what we are doing is the same as what is discussed. It might have become a little boring for you listening to the same way in which our different people peel the internal limiting membrane. I have titled my talk as Responding to Non-Responders of Diabetic Macular Edema, where vitreous surgery is the last choice. Before I begin, we need to know whom a non-responder is. He is a patient whom you have been treating for years, you have injected several times, the pathology that you are dealing with is either persistent or new changes are coming in and you find that his visual acuity is dropping. That is a stage when the option for surgical management comes in. 
And it is very disheartening to note that in a patient who undergoes medical treatment for diabetic macular edema, there is about 25 percentage, 25.9 percentage to be exact, who are non-responders. And in this subgroup of patients, you have to look at other so options. You would have gone through the work, starting with one anti-VEGF anti agent, switching to a different agent, and the patient has either tolerance or tachyphylaxis, and then using a combination of agents, and when nothing else works, we resort to vitreous surgery. Ideally, from my perspective, that is not the time when you should advise surgery to the patient. Because at that point of time, his macula is so grossly damaged. So even after you have done a wonderful surgery, you are, he's not going to have much visual improvement. But there is an advantage in that his retinopathy would have stabilized with the vitreous surgery. So before you take a decision to operate on your patients, there are very pertinent points that you have to look at. First, whether his diabetic status is controlled, whether it has been worsening over the years. So even if you operate on the patient, you will have persistence of the macular edema in the post-operative period. Secondly, you have to look at the lead retinal perfusion. Is there a macular ischemia? Is there a peripheral retinal ischemia? Peripheral retinal ischemia is okay. You can give laser at the end of the surgery or inject anti-VEGF. But if you have a macular patient with a macular ischemia and if you're going to operate on him, be wise enough to counsel the patient that your procedure may stabilize the process, but his vision will not become normal. You have to take a close look at the vitreoretinal interface and find out whether there is a thickening of the internal limiting membrane. A thick and taut internal limiting membrane is a characteristic feature of a recalcitrant diabetic macular edema. You look at the amount of anteroposterior or tangential traction that is there, whether the PVD is there, whether it is complete, whether it is incomplete, whether there is PVD at the periphery. You have to do a thorough analysis before you take your patient into the theater. So we have gone through this. We have looked at all the things that we look at. And surgery is indicated when there is a macular edema with a vitreo macular pathology. Although there is a definite subgroup of patients with a densely swollen, boggy, diffuse macular edema without macular ischemia where there is no vitreoretinal interface pathology who do respond to vitrectomy and deroofing of the internal limiting membrane. They do respond to that treatment option. So a surgically basically is a co-vitrectomy. You don't have to shave the vitreous base. You detach the posterior hyaloid like all my young colleagues did. You peel the external ep epiretinal membrane, peel the internal limiting membrane, you do laser, and you do give anti at the end of the procedure. So you are combining the good options, the good effects of all treatment modalities to give the maximum benefit to your patient. This is a very nice patient of mine. I've been treating him for years. He was 58 years old when he ultimately took a decision to undergo surgery. He is a diabetic. He has all the works. He has renal failure. He has dyslipidemia. He has undergone five injections that I have given and several injections elsewhere where he went. When he was dissatisfied with me, he would go elsewhere for treatment. And uh, Sorry. So he has a proliferative diabetic retinopathy and what you see right here could either be a thickened and condensed hyaloid. At the beginning of the procedure I'm peeling off what I think is a thickened condensed hyaloid. There is no vascular proliferation on it. I'm using a knife spatula, a very nice instrument which has a knife on one side and it's blunt on the other. I do most of my dissection with that. You peel off the thick uh, hyaloid and you see that the macula is uh, boggy. There is a lot of hard exudation. He has been treated over the years. Oculoblue is used to stain the hyaloid. And if you look carefully at the previous surgery, the ILM was a little loose. See, you see how thick the internal limiting membrane is. It's a thick and taut internal limiting membrane. 
which has to be peeled in bits and pieces. It does not come out like a flap that Manoj showed. It will not come out as a single layer because this patient has undergone multiple sittings of laser. The membrane is adherent. Although it is thick, it is very difficult to peel it and you can peel it only in layers. This is his other eye. These are two eyes of the same patient. He has a more extensive pathology in the other eye. Here PVD is induced. And look at this macula. This is not the stage when you should be, you should be doing surgery for him. If you want to give him some visual results, you have to counsel him for surgery at an earlier date. I failed in this patient, although I have been seeing him on and off for the last 15 years. You can hardly make out the contrast between the internal limiting membrane and the swollen retina. The membrane comes out almost as a single layer, mostly because this laser may not have been effective because of this retinal swelling. You use a combination of all factors. You use laser, you use anti -VEGF, you leave behind, I leave behind a little bit of TA at the end of the procedure so that the steroid can cause a reduction in the retinal swelling in the postoperative period. And this is his eye down the line. You see how much the exudates have cleared. I have him on follow-up for the last five years at least. And uh, he has been, he has no significant visual improvement, nothing that he can boast of, but his macula is fine. There are definite advantages of, p of doing a vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema. You are deroofing the thickened internal limiting membrane. You are removing the inflammatory sump, which is the vitreous cavity. The half-life of the VEGF that is produced in the eye becomes reduced. And whatever drug you, that you are injecting at the end of the surgery diffuses into the macula. So you have definite advantages of performing past planar vitrectomy in your patient. In addition to that, you are removing ascorbate, which is the main eater of oxygen in the retina. So, so the oxygen does not reach the retina. The, re, the oxygen is taken up by the ascorbate and antioxidant in the vitreous cavity. Once you remove that, there is better oxygenation of the tissues. So PPB for diabetic macular edema is indicated in the presence of an obvious anteroposterior hyaloidal traction, tangential traction, and it is also indicated in non-tractional diffuse diabetic macular edema. You have to evaluate your OCTs preoperatively. You should have a one-in-one -one understanding with your patient, discuss how it is going to be in the postoperative period, explain to him that his macular edema will take time to come down, and most of the time, the number of injections that he requires after that is much, much less than the number of injections you would have had to take had he not undergone the surgery. The results with the resolution of the macular edema is very good. Visual recovery may not be that good. From my personal point of view, I have been operating on diabetic macular edema from probably 1996 onwards. The results have been extremely satisfactory, both for the surgeon as well as for the patient. So there is something which needs to be covered when you are dealing with peeling of the internal limiting membrane. This is not related to diabetic macular edema. These are the results of patients with the macular epiretinal membrane. If you follow up your patient and do an RNFL analysis in this patient, you see that there is a definite thinning of the temporal macula. In the first, first one month of the postoperative period, there is when SANFL occurs or a swelling of the arcuate retinal layer occurs, the macula is thickened, and then you find that there is gradually the retinal nerve fiber layer thins down. This thinning of the nerve fiber layer, fortunately, does not give rise to a scotoma or a visual field defect. And it correlates, has a definite correlation with the amount of retinal tissue that is stuck to the undersurface of the internal limiting membrane that you peel. There is a definite dysfunction in the macula induced by the peeling. It produces ERG changes, but luckily for us, it does not translate into a visual loss in this patient. However, when you are talking to the patient, all this should be put across to him. This is the Donafel or the dissociated optic nerve fiber layer that you see in patients who undergo. Postoperatively, if you see what the post-op slides that Biju, Ashrad or Manoj showed, that there is a sort of appearance of the surface of the retina. It is because at those points, the Muller cell is damaged and the retina has collapsed in that area the surface of the retina becomes irregular. 
So you are, you are taking away the retinal scaffold in that area and definitely it produces some physical deformity on the retinal surface and luckily it does not translate into a visual loss. So ILM peeling is a good procedure, it is safe. So you should not go back home thinking that macular surgery is very easy. We do sometimes deal with very, very difficult cases. I thought I would show you three of the stinkers that I have dealt with in my practice. This is a man from Central Kerala who came to me with uh, um, submacular hemorrhage. I did a vitrectomy and subretinal injection of air along with anti -VEGF. He did very well. His edema clear. And if you look at the second slide, you can see at the bottom there is an yellow air, yellow color which is the subretinal blood which has been pushed away from the center and then he developed a macular hole. He underwent surgery for that with a different technique from what is described by Manoj. I do not use gas tamponade. I have not used it since 2007. I use autologous blood, the patient's blood drawn at the time of surgery to create a sticky base at the macula, the macula hole. And then I stuff with a three-layer stuffing. First layer will be the autologous blood. Second layer will be the internal limiting membrane. And the third layer will again be autologous blood. This has given me very good results. This is a technique I use in large macular holes, more than 1,000 micron size. So it's a huge macular hole. You can see the stuffed uh, tissue. He did quite well. And on follow-up, he had recurrence of the whatever pathology, the coronal neovascular membrane, which is responsible for the subretinal blood, six months down the rain, and he's now getting injections for the same. This is another stinker, a patient who underwent an uneventful phaco vitrectomy for um, epiretinal membrane and this is what is there on the first post-operative day. She has a central retinal artery occlusion. So here you are, do, you are doing your surgery. There is no efflux of fluid from the eye. You are using valve cannulas. Whatever goes in, goes in. You are injecting material into the eye. You are in using TA into the eye. For some time there is an overload of fluid into the eye. You're injecting a dye into the eye, and all this can hamper the perfusion and result in this situation. So if you have a patient who at any point of time had a raised intraocular pressure in those patients, on your active port, it would be a good idea to take out your sleeve, take out the valve, and have that port open during surgery so that this does not occur. Last week, I operated on a fellow eye. This I did well. Fortunately, it was a partial... Uh, Incomplete uh, occlusion, she went away and came back again for surgery in the other eye. In the second eye, I did that. I took away, took out the valve so that there is an egress of fluid from my active port. And this is the third stinker, a classmate of mine who brought his mother for surgery. Had a huge vitreomacular attraction and we did a combined phaco vitrectomy and after the phaco was over and I went in, this is what I saw. It had derooved spontaneously and produced a ma large macular hole. So your surgical technique becomes a little difficult. So the take home message is that you have to speak to your patients, show them all the images, speak to them, tell them what to expect in the post-operative period. And I thank you very much for being here on the last day of the meeting and thanks for your patient hearing. Do you have any questions uh, for discussion, anybody, or any topic to be? Uh, yeah, Ash. Uh, regarding the combined phaco vitrectomy, how do you uh, um, uh, plan your post-operative medications to reduce the inflammation? What all medicines you will add for? First and foremost, I told you I leave behind a little Tramstilon yesterday in the vitreous cavity. It ensures that I have a very quiet eye in the post-operative period and I have not seen a single patient whose pressure has gone up. Very Secondly, I use uh, cyclopendylate to keep the pupil dilated. I use cyclopendylate so that the pupil is a little mobile, a single application at night. So this ensures that there is no problem. We have been doing, I have been doing phaco vitrectomy since 2000. We also do combined surgery. The cataract surgeon, Dr. Sai, will come and do the this thing. And one or two cases we had Iris Bombay and uh, IOP variations and all. Probably we have missed an occludable angle or something. We just 
Yeah. Become uh, that we have missed probably. If your gas ambulance is pushed forward. Maybe that is cause. Otherwise, uh, it is quite a. But like Ashad said, there is a definite myopic shift in your post-operative uh, refraction, about 0.5 mm -hmm. diopters. What you can do is that if you are do, when you are doing your pre-operative biometry, if you are using an uh, A-scan biometer, you take your axial length you, and add to it the central retinal thickness that you get from OCT. It will ensure that you get a, a, a true axial length. If you are using an optical biometer, that does not, it does not matter because you are measuring up to the retinal pigment epithelium. So it ensures that there is, there is no post-operative surprise. In fact, and, and nowadays um, uh, in most of the macular surgeries, you know, we would tend to prefer an earlier cataract surgery. So many of these guys have gas and then they end up with a cataract subsequently in the fakey guys. So therefore, you know, it makes a little uh, sense to actually operate on the cataracts earlier. And we also do a combined uh, procedure I mean, where we do the cataract and, and vitectomy in the same setting. Unless the patient wants a stage surgery for all posterior segment procedures which require cataract, a combined procedure would be ideal. We put a suture, a single suture, the, the um, FACO incision alone is sutured with a single suture which we remove at the second postoperative visit. Or at the end of the surgery also if there is no leak we can. We can, we can do that. We leave it for a week. Mm. We tried out initially by putting the ports, the infusion port at the beginning of the procedure followed by FACO. We found out that it inevitably causes a very much deepening of the posterior sure. chamber. And uh, when you are going back in, you may, you, with your active port, you may damage the posterior capsule. Regarding, Madam, regarding, uh, you said about uh, stuffing of the ILM in the macular hole. And uh, what, what is the specific instrument that you use for this, whether you use the vitrocle probe itself or the, the, the silicone tape cannula, is there any uh, risk of enlarging the hole during the procedure? I, I use a spatula, a blunt spatula, steel spatula. Indo-German has a thin, twen I, most of my surgeries are 23 gauge. I use a 23 gauge blunt spatula, it is blunt. And I, I use a Finesse's flex loop to initiate the ILM peeling. I do a double re macular rexis. The first rexis is a small rexis because I do not want too much tissue to stuff in. Sometimes you have a, the hole may not accommodate all the ILM. So my first rexis is to stuff and the second one is to relax yeah, them. When you, when you are stuffing, you are using the same spatula itself? Yes. Okay. It, it is seen that if you traumatize the edges of the hole, when I learned, first learned macular hole surgery, we were thought to traumatize the edge of the hole because it released tissue factors and caused the hole to close. Those days we did only a co vitrectomy, there was no staining, we did not use TA. So we also did not know whether our vitrectomy was complete or not. So those days we were thought to just use a blunt spatula and scrape on the edges of the hole. But if you have seen that after ILM peeling, you take a blunt spatula and uh, scrape on the, not on the edges of the hole, along the sides of the hole, you can see that the hole closes in the form of a horizontal slit, yeah. which is an intraoperative sign that uh, your surgery is going to work. So at the end of the procedure, I take a spatula and s try to push the hole inside, mm -hmm. to close the hole mechanically. And you can s always see that the hole becomes a small slit. Because sometimes it happens that after the stuffing, it, it, it seems that sometimes the hole is seeming a little more larger than initially. You know, once you stuff it, uh, it, it because of the tissue is there, it will be protruding out a, a little bit. I, I, I think, Abhijit uh, sir, um, uh, the instrument uh, that you, you, that you use you now depends on uh, what you are uh, used to. Madam is, uh, you know, she is quite uh, used to the, uh, you know, to the thing. So and I try to use the forceps itself, you know. You can, you can use to, an ILM forceps. You can use the ILM forceps itself to stuff. So the, or, or the cutter, sometimes I use the cutter. So the, I don't think the instrument uh, matters, but the uh, uh, thing is that stuffing should be a very gentle process. And as the newer techniques have evolved, it appears like you don't need to stuff it. You can just, you know, uh, just bunch them up at the fo fovea, at the, around the uh, hole. And do a fluid Even direction. that may not be necessary. If you have a large ILM flap, you just invert it over the hole. If you are doing a fluid air exchange, it stays there. I don't do a fluid air exchange, so I have to stuff it in for my flap to remain over the hole. 
I think uh, each surgeon has uh, some preferences, some methods which works with that surgeon. So we don't want to confuse everyone uh, which is the ideal method. So there will be some difference, but uh, I think uh, reasonab reasonably a standard macular hole surgery 90% will close. Even recently I see some patients told, I mean some doctor has told is it useless not to do any surgery for macular hole. It is not, not like that. Most of the holes, large holes also 90% closes by one of these procedures and visual recovery is also not bad. If you don't operate a macular hole, ultimately it will be county finger 2 meter, right? So if you operate, it may become 624, 618, six, large macular hole and become, sometimes it uh, gains 69. So that is the message that I thought. A type 2 hole closure may be there in some of the patients, especially if you are dealing with very large holes. That is also a type of closure. Although the hole is there, there is no subretinal fluid and the patient's vision definitely does improve. So once again, thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. Hope we have given you a take-home message. Thank you.